In early September 1943, American and Commonwealth forces began the advance up the boot of Italy. The United States Fifth Army, under the command of Lieutenant General Mark Clark, moved through the western part of Italy. In parallel, the British Eighth Army under General Bernard Montgomery advanced on the eastern side. By December, they were on the way towards the main objective of the campaign, Rome. Between the two armies was a fearsome barrier, the Apennines. An almost impassable mountain range that spreads throughout Italy, dividing the peninsula into two parts. The ideal terrain for the defense. The German army, under the command of Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, adopted the strategy of a slow, carefully controlled withdrawal up Italy's boot, utilizing the defensive characteristics, of the rugged terrain, to their limit. To break any line they faced, the Allies had to spend time preparing the attack. When the assault went in, the Germans would usually hold their positions for only a brief time before retreating in good order to a new, well-prepared defensive line. This strategy slowed the Allies' advance to a crawl. It also ensured that German casualties and loss of war material remained tolerably low. At the same time, the losses of attacking forces, were always much higher than the casualties inflicted on the defender. The Allies' progress in Italy was painfully slow. Gradually, they have become involved in the costly war of attrition, with a determined and skillful enemy. What was supposed to be a swift advance, on what Winston Churchill called, the soft underbelly of Europe, turned out to be one of the hardest campaigns of the Second World War. To accelerate the advance towards Rome, the commander of the Allies' troops in Italy, General Harold Alexander, planned for the Eighth Army, to advance on Pescara, and swing west, to break into the wide valley that extends inland from Pescara, through the Apennines to Ovazzano, 80 kilometers east of Rome. If the plan succeeds, the German divisions would be outflanked and forced to withdraw, leaving the open route for the Fifth Army towards Rome. The execution of this plan began on November 20, when the spearhead of the British Eighth Army, the Fifth Corps, attacked the German line on the Sangro River. However, this time defense was different. Instead of a quick retreat as they did in previous months, the German troops put up a fierce defense. The Eighth Army has reached the Winter Line. At the Winter Line, Kesselring intended to stop Allies' advance to Rome. Seeing the attacking forces piling up, General Joachim Lemelson, commander of the Tenth Army, sent three additional divisions, to strengthen the only possible route of the British advance, just off the Adriatic coast. Determined defense, in combination with heavy rains in November, slowed the British advance furthermore. While the heavy fighting on the Sangro River raged on, Montgomery realized, that Rome would not be taken soon. Instead, he focused on taking Pescara, much closer, easier, and still a target of strategic significance. He also turned his attention, on the closer target, the small coastal town which lays on the route to Pescara, Ortona. Besides the advance of the Eighth Army, heavy rains and a sea of mud, also slowed down the transport of supplies. The precious war material, had to be transported to the front line, by the poor and the damaged road network from the ports in southern Italy. The aerial reconnaissance photos, showed that Ortona possessed a deep water port, backed by a rail yard. The combination of a usable port, and a rail line was very tempting to General Montgomery. Although Germans destroyed a large part of the port, Montgomery still believed, that his engineers could get the port operational, shortly after the town is occupied. The operational port, in this part of Italy, would solve the logistical problems, for a further advance. After failing to stop the British advance across the Sangro River, the Germans withdrew to a new defensive line, just a few kilometers north, on the higher ground above the Moro River Valley. On December 6, the 1st Canadian Infantry Division, under the newly appointed commander, 
General Christopher Vokes, replaced the 78th Division, which suffered heavy losses during the Sangro River Offensive. The Canadians took up position on the far east side of the V Corps, along the Adriatic coast, just before another major offensive. Soon, the division was involved in heavy fighting against troops of the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, to establish a bridgehead on the northern bank of the Moro River, suffering heavy losses, especially among junior officers. Inexperienced as the divisional commander, General Vokes was under terrific pressure from 8th Army headquarters, to continue advancing to Pescara. After successfully crossing the Moro River, General Vokes thought the Germans would pull back, to a new line, formed on the river, just as they did in previous months. The closest river, was the Ariely, north of Ortona. What he didn't know, was that Germans changed their tactic. On December 10, anticipating a clear road ahead, Vokes sent his troops, straight into the ambush. Less than two kilometers north of the Moro River, the Canadians came across a new German line, formed in the deep and narrow gully, south of the Ortona or Sogna Road. The Germans considered Winter Line, as the final point to stop the British advance. When they reached the Winter Line, Field Marshal Kesselring, ordered his troops to create an impregnable system of positions in depth. The period when Germans traded the ground for the time was over. Now, they made a defensive line, in depth, using all the natural obstacles the terrain offered them. Instead of bypassing the natural barrier in front of him, and outflank the defenders, for the next nine days, Vokes constantly ordered frontal attacks on the gully. He committed all of his units in frontal attacks, including the reserve battalions, of the 3rd Infantry Brigade. Each attack, failed miserably, and casualties mounted. During the fighting for the gully, the Canadians did everything the Germans expected, becoming the easy target, for the deadly mortar and machine gun fire. The battle at the gully was extremely fierce. Heavy weather, and muddy terrain, led to exhaustion and high losses. On December 19, after days of constant attacks and counterattacks, the Canadians broke the line, and German troops pulled back. By then, the men of the 1st Canadian Division, have been in combat without rest, continuously for 15 days. All division battalions took part in the battle, and suffered heavy losses. The division significantly lost its strength. Combined with losses due to sickness and battle exhaustion, some companies fell to platoon size. Many units were merged, to have at least some combat capabilities. To compensate casualties of the combat troops, the brigade commanders, organized frontline companies of supporting units, headquarters administrative staff, cooks, mechanics, and other rear area personnel. Having no longer a proper reserve, Vokes pulled out the 2nd Brigade from the front line, to rest them, while the battle for the gully still raged on. On December 20, to exploit the breakthrough of the German line, Vokes sent two battalions of the 2nd Brigade, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, and the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, to Ortona. The Loyal Edmonton Regiment advanced on Ortona or Sogna Road, and the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, moved along the coastal road. By night, both battalions reached the outskirts of Ortona. Neither Vokes, nor the 8th Army Headquarters staff, was so convinced that the Germans would make a serious stand at Ortona. The Allies and Axis strategy, did not support fighting in built-up areas, because the troops in urban areas, were often at risk of being encircled, and trapped there. Since no one expected a fight for the town, the plans were already developed for the port repairs, and to turn Ortona into a maintenance and rest area. For that reason, Ortona had been spared significant aerial, or artillery bombardment. Fearing that the already weakened 90th Panzer Grenadier Division, would crack under pressure, and the front on the Adriatic coast would collapse, Field Marshal Kesselring and General Lemelson, 
decided to reinforce the front line, with the elements of the 1st Parachute Division. The paratroopers of the 1st Parachute Division, were an elite unit of the 10th Army. The hardened veterans, with an experience of fighting in the Low Countries, Crete and the Soviet Union, formed the core of the division. The rest of the men, were well-trained volunteers, who accepted paratroopers' values, fanatism and fighting spirit. The division, was indeed an elite unit. Consequently, the paratroopers were often sent to reinforce, the most endangered sectors of the front. The men of the 2nd Battalion, of the 3rd Parachute Regiment, arrived in Ortona on 13 December. Immediately they began to prepare the town into a defensive position. They demolished buildings, which offered them innumerable, well-concealed firing positions. The narrow streets, were blocked with debriefs and barricades to channel their opponents into pre-designated killing zones. The Germans also were not sure that Ortona would become a battlefield. They expected that Canadians would make, the main effort on the right flank of the front, to encircle the town. In that case, the defenders would have to withdraw. However, Vokes did not have time to wait for the success of the pincer movement. The pressure of his superiors to seize Ortona increased with every new day. He hoped, that even if the city was defended, a swift and decisive action, would drive out the defenders quickly. This time, the Canadians were much more careful than before. During the night of December 20, Major Jim Stone, commander of the D Company, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, and Peter Carr Harris, an officer of the Royal Canadian Engineers, went on a reconnaissance, up to Corso Vittorio Emanuele, the town's main street, to determine if the road was mined. Moving cautiously through the night, they encountered no enemy presence. It looked like the town was deserted. It seemed from their reconnaissance as if the Germans, were not in Ortona, at all.